No man who has taken time to holistically give himself to the word of God has not proved it that it works. The word of God cannot fail because this is the absoluteness of his power. An open invitation to a life in the word. Because you have received the faith of Christ and you have embraced the righteousness of God through faith. Grace and peace are multiplied. That is why we lay hands on the lame and they walk. We lay hands on the blind and they see. We lay hands on the deaf and they hear. It's powerful enough to give you the answer on its first application. Arise on the wings of revelation. Align your destiny. Transform your world. This is Fenero Make Manifest with Apostle Grace Lubega. Um, with me in studio, we have a mighty woman of God. Pastor Modesta Sweeney. Please <laughs> greet our viewers, Pastor Modesta. Hello, our viewers today. I'm very happy to be here. God is working. Amen. And uh, of course, um, we have our father in the ministry, Apostle Grace Lovega. And um, there's a reason why we asked him to, to share this, um, com have this conversation with him. Because firstly, uh, the Bible is very clear. Paul says, I'll not speak of things that have not been routing me, whether in word or deed. Um, you could ask this, this question to any man, but also by, 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 by reason of observation, we have observed him in the ministry. Um, God has blessed his life physically. We have seen wealth. We have seen divine providence in his life. So um, we have been having several conversations with him, with the pastors and various people in this ministry. And today... Uh, I want to let you know that he's not just going to speak just from the place of revelation, but also God has done big things in him, in his life. You can see the ministry that we are part of, Venero Ministries International. It's all over the world, and uh, we are grateful to God. So um, we're going to open the discussion, and I'll start with a question to Apostle Grace. Apostle Grace, um, uh, the scriptures are very clear concerning our inheritance in Christ. The Bible says that we have been given all things pertaining to life and godliness. The Bible is very clear that we have been brought into a wealthy place. The Bible is very clear that we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he was rich but became poor, that we might become rich. So that is the truth concerning our lives in Christ. However, today, especially in Africa and uh, many parts of the world, many Christians are not having this as an experience in life. Okay? And uh, that's, a, that's how we would like to start the discussion. And however, uh, a few weeks ago, we were having a manifest meeting in a certain part of this country. And uh, you opened that, that meeting with a scripture, which I would like us to have on set, Ecclesiastes 5.9. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5.9. It says, Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. And... When you opened up this scripture, it opened me so much to many things. And, and you promised us that we might have a discussion around this. So based on what I've just asked Apostle Grace, uh, based on this scripture, can you please explain to us why many Christians are walk, walking in what God has ordained them to walk in? Thank you very much, Pastor Zach. I hope this conversation will be interactional. Okay. Now, um, like the man of God has said, we were somewhere and the Lord placed something on, 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 on my spirit on Ephesians 5, 9. But um, allow me to read it from the Amplified Version. All right? It says, moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field and in all the king is an advantage to a land with cultivated fields the king is an advantage to a land with cultivated fields now let, let's let's begin this way when it's talking about wealth you know number one we're still dealing within the church with a very sick mentality that it is okay to be poor or that when you are rich or if somebody is wealthy therefore they are ungodly or wicked you see um, and and I, would, I want to think that from a common sense perspective. Abraham was a righteous man. The Bible says he was wealthy. Job, God boasts over his righteousness from oars. 
And the Bible says he was the richest man in the East. The richest. He was known to be the richest man in the East. But God is boasting over him before Satan. That look at my servant Job. There is none perfect and upright as a man. One, he says, that feareth God and eschewth evil. <laughs> One that feareth God and eschewth evil. But it was the wealthiest. So, we were not called to poverty. And two, there is something in God that has to make us wealthy. Do you agree? But let me begin my conversation from uh, a sort of a discovery that came into the world a couple of years ago. I've shared this once, but I want to repeat it for many people who I know have not heard it or uh, probably have just learned of this ministry recently. There was a conversation from uh, our land friends, our people, that the world had designed a system, a mindset, an idea, and it has been thrown into all tradition and culture that men in the world are rewarded through merit. So when your parents are taking you to, to school, what do they say? Go to school and study hard such that you don't be what? Poor. We don't want poverty. In, in, in our culture, we have, we have, we have a, a, an adage that uh, the pen does not lie. Eh? <laughs> uh, but the meaning there is that if you go to school, definitely you'll become something. So people go to school, graduate, top of their classes, and uh, some of them are, the, uh, are, are thrown in very, very um, promising fields of life. Yes, they earn a living. Some follow through the normal life of process, clerkship and you know, supervisory and the rest. And so that's how the world has known that we reward merit. And now they discover that there is a group of people that quite does not match that equation. They did not go to school. They perhaps don't even match up to some of the IQ, intelligent quotients, or even the EQ, emotional quotients of certain individuals. They were not connected in life. They perhaps are even careless in many aspects of life. And then they saw some of these people making it in life. They built some of the biggest conglomerates. They've built some of the greatest brands in the world. They are employing those which were top of the class. So there's a question. How did these ones make it? How did these ones make it? And so you will find that the richest people in the world, and I'm going to come to that a bit later, are not necessarily rich by the merit of education. You see, Zuckerberg just got his degree recently, but he's hiring the best brains we know in, in information technology. So that's when they coined the word called naive meritocracy. Naive meritocracy that not everybody who has made it or will make it in life necessarily goes through your principles and patterns and understanding and interpretations of merit. And because of that, God has already introduced by his wisdom an unequal scale within humanity. Because besides the wisdom that my education can give me, there is another wisdom that I have not connected into. Now, already the way wealth is distributed in the world is unequal. We agree? If you go and read reports from uh, Credit Suisse or Oxfam, you will see that wealth is distributed unequally in the world. That about 1% of the world's population has more than 40% of the world's wealth. 1%. 1% of the world's population has 40% of the world's wealth. The report says that half of the world's population, it has increased a bit now to five. Half of the world's population lives below five dollars a day. Five. Half of the world's population. 
half of the world. If you have 7 billion people in the world, 3.5, live below $5 a day. Do you want to tell me that in there there are no tithers? Do you want to tell me that in there there are no people who are educated, who have gone to great schools? Do you want to tell me that all of those people in that half west, do you want to tell me that they don't know how to add one plus two? Or that they're not wise? No, they are. But the Bible has told you that the rest is not to the swift. He says the battle is not to the strong, neither bread, listen, to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. But time and chance happens to them all. That's the question. We're talking about the perfect balance here. Time and chance. That's the perfect balance. You see? And I'll teach about the perfect balance very soon. Why you have two eyes, why you have two ears, why you have two hands, why you have two feet. Or you can say one mouth, but it's a set of two to eat. You see? God has created man with the perfect balance. And the realm of two sometimes is what helps us reconcile even the covenants. Why where there was an old, there had to be a new. You see, it's a, it's a bigger aspect than what we're able to, to, to speak today because of time. But anyway, I'm trying to, to help us get into something. Now, when somebody says that riches are not to men of understanding, it means that sometimes even our understanding is life does not qualify us for wealth. If he says that bread is not to men of wisdom, it means that sometimes our provision might not require so much of worldly wisdom. Here we're talking about worldly wisdom. Here we're talking about worldly understanding. You see? When we're talking about favor, he says you don't need to have skill to be favored. You don't need. Yes, there are people who are favored because of what they do, merit. But there are people in the world who are favored even without the abilities, the skill, the innate potency to qualify for that favor. But he says, time and chance happens to them Oh, naive meritocracy. He's trying to tell us that time and chance are above any sphere of, 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 of interpretation, any sphere of understanding. They are above any place of qualification. They are above any merit. Time and chance are above any education. Time and chance are above any connections and networks. Time and chance are above they are above. Somebody shout hallelujah. And right there, if you study the Hebrew for time and chance, it's the experiences. The experiences. Time actually right there in that scripture is experiences. Specific occurrences that are given to you in the spirit realm to know how to respond to the spirit. That's time. Now chance is the power of opportunity. It is the power of of opportunity, what God has given you to be able to explore that which you have picked from the experiences that have been given you by God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, because man is created in the image and likeness of God, they still carry the essence of God within there and certain principles underlie that to make them a success by merit. And this is something that the church is not talking about. Because we were not taught that way. We were taught to tithe. And tithing is right. I give more than a tenth. In fact, sometimes, almost every year, I give 70% of my income. But it's not so that because people give and tithe, therefore they live where they're supposed to be with God. I know poor tithers. Now that's a fact people will not own up. I know many of many men of God will say that's not possible, but I know people, some who are watching me and they say, Apostle, I tithe, but I'm still under a certain threshold. There's a certain thing that cannot allow me to break into the next place of life. You see, if they tell you that 735 million people live in extreme poverty, and they tell you the biggest chunk of that number is just a sickness away, <laughs> They're just a sickness away. The, the day they, they get somebody sick, they'll sell everything and go to zero, to minus zero. 
They're just a yield, a crop yield away, that if that yield does not come through, their life is gone. Don't think that those people there, all of them don't tithe. And don't think that all the richest people in the world tithe. So that means that God is against the tithe. Please understand my principles. God is not against our tithes, our first priests, and all those things. Those are all acts of faith that we have not to get. The problem with people is when they are giving, they are still in the realm of giving to receive. No. See, it is true when Jesus says, give and it shall come back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give to your bosom. But you see, when we transcend to the New Testament, you'll understand that that is more and could create more lust. But you would not fault the Christ because you were speaking to men which were not regenerated. Are you following? When Jesus becomes our poverty, carries our poverty, we are poor. We are born poor. Mm -hmm. And then he comes with his riches. And the Bible says, we know the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. When we enter the New Testament dispensation, we cannot tell people, to give because it shall come back to them. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, shall men give to their bosom. The New Testament creation does not live only on the principle of what they give, but above all on the principle of what they have been inherited in Christ. The inheritance. The inheritance. Now, let's go to Ecclesiastes 5.9. Why... I insist to read it in the Amplified. I'm going to show you a very wonderful revelation. Could not share then. He says, the profit of the earth is for all. Meaning, God, firstly, let us first emphasize that. God has made the earth to be profitable for every living creature. Every living creature. In fact, uh, I read a report which showed that if you were to get all the money in the world and distributed it with all the people in the world, every individual would have about $42,000. Every individual walking the face of this earth now, if you get all the wealth in the world, that means the richest 1% is almost twice as rich as the whole earth. You see that? How many up there are speaking in tongues? <laughs> huh? And, and so the, 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 I think the church has to get to a deeper conversation. One, to own up where we have not understood. But two, to really understand and connect to what God is telling us. To what God is telling us. I, I might not be uh, at liberty to discuss what God has done with me and for me. Mm. But some of you know my personal life. Mm. But I have seen that it's a lie to think that God rewards you based on where you are. Mm. Whether you're in the United States or you're in mm. Europe or you're in America or you're in Africa or you're in the third world country, the 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 poorest country, God's place of blessing is not based on where you are and what's available for you. It's based on how you understand the spirit realm. So let's have this conversation. So he has said, the profit of the earth is for all. That means everybody was supposed to benefit from what comes from the earth. We must agree with that. No man has a single exclusivity to what's available for them on the earth. But when he says that the profit of the earth is for all, it doesn't mean that he limits how much each individual can access from the world. So when he speaks about the treasures in secret places, I shall give you those treasures of darkness. There, there is wealth that we have not even seen or even imagined exists, but it is there. So he says, I'll give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places. He says that you may know that I, the Lord, which called thee by name, I'm the God of Israel. That is how you will know. That is how you know. He does that to actually prove that he is God. So not all wealth that is available on the face of the earth has been truly explored. They released the report sometime that the wealth under the Democratic Republic of Congo is equal or more than the wealth on top of the United States. On top of the United States, the wealth in Congo, under Congo, is equal or more than the wealth on top of the United States. Now, the United States is probably one of the richest nations in the world. 
And if you see what they have on the land, every state, every city, I've visited a couple of, 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 of states, these people are filthy. But to imagine that all of that you can see with your eye, the skyscrapers, the biggest buildings in the world, the gold and silver on top of the United States is under one country where we still see poverty and sickness and lack. Something is not right in the equation. Of course, we can blame them. They colonized us. They did that. And that's okay. But at one point, the mentality has to come out of the plantation. It has to stop blaming who did this and who did that, okay? So since then, and the church came uh, to bring the gospel, there are 10,000 churches, they say. About 10,000 churches in Kinshasa alone. So something should be able to change this narrative. Somebody shout hallelujah. I believe that the wealth of nations is in the revelation of the gospel through the church. How many believe it? So, the gold underground was given by God free. The diamond underground was given by God free. The iron that drives your car, your, 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 that you use to build your car was given by God free. The rare earth minerals, cobalt and the rest was given by God free. Everything from the earth is free. Everything. I, I know somebody in this ministry who bought a huge chunk of a gold reserve somewhere in the DRC. And they bought it from somebody who all his lifetime owned that land, but they have never had the power to get that gold out. He says, an evil have I seen on the earth that God has given a man power, glory, and honor that that man will want nothing. But the Bible says, but he has not the power to walk in it. And a stranger, the Bible says, cometh and eateth it. God calls it vanity and an evil disease. So this man has gold under his land, but he has never had the opportunity, Pastor Zach, to eat of it. And a stranger comes, somebody from nowhere, and buys that property, and in a couple of months later, they start mining gold from that very property. So you, you can imagine how much is and could be available for us, but we just don't have the grace and wisdom to understand that. Now, but the secret is in the scripture, the very scripture God has given us here. He has said, he has given us a clue. He says that the earth is for all, full colon. The king himself also, he said, is served by the field. Now, he has introduced the conversation of a king. He has introduced the conversation of a king. Now, let me explain where this comes from. Proverbs, song of songs, Ecclesiastes, are all written by one man. But they are all written by that man at different stages of his life. Do you understand that? When you now go and read Proverbs and read about Song of Songs or Ecclesiastes, and you try to date them from when they were written, you will realize that the order is actually Song of Songs, Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes. And these represent the king's mind and the stages of his growth. So when, when, when we're talking about Song of Songs, when you read it, you see, you know, you can't blame the guy. 700 what? Concubines, 300 wives. Him and girls was something. He had something there. But he, he, need, he needed like a process to grow. Of course, we can look at it from that perspective, but it also has a revelational part that is so rich too. And I'm going to teach about it soon. But how God through a love relationship with a woman is able to give revelation to the church through the man of wisdom, you know, it's amazing. So you see Solomon grow from that space of life and then he gets into his mid-age. And he starts to understand life differently. And then he brings in the conversations of Proverbs. And in his late years, he starts to become gray. Remember the Bible says that a, ho a hoary head is of glory if it ages in righteousness. As he grows older, he starts to learn life differently. 
and then he writes Ecclesiastes. That's why in Ecclesiastes you find conversations like, I went out to find out that which, you know, it makes men happy. In Ecclesiastes 2, I drank wine, I amassed myself women, I built myself houses, I got myself maiden servants, possessions of great and, uh, and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem. Before me, I was rich, I gathered myself silver and then peculiar treasures. So when he's talking about the maidens, that's when the concubines come in, right? I got men singers, women singers, the delights of the sons of men. But he says, but my wisdom stayed with me. You see? He has that wisdom which is gifted by God. But then he has a question that that wisdom cannot give. That, that's why the church has to transition beyond Solomonic wisdom to Messianic wisdom. One with greater wisdom is come. The Bible says, Jesus Christ. So the judgments have to increase. We cannot think like Solomon because there are things his wisdom could not give him except by experience. When we come to Messianic wisdom, we don't need years to get it. Somebody shout hallelujah. So back to the story. He does all of this and he's trying to do all of this. And then he gets to the end of all life and he says, you know, but all of this was all vanity and vexation of spirit. So I, he's teaching me even in his weaknesses, that I don't need to do all of that to find the meaning of life. There has to be another place of purpose. Now, I want you to note that because Ecclesiastes 5.9 is there. He's speaking from that place. He's not speaking from a man who has started to do life. He's not speaking from a man who's trying to discover and explore, to test out and try things. No, it comes from a man who has been there, done that, got the t-shirt, been proved and tested. And then he gets to the end of life and then picks the wisdom of life. That's different from what he could receive as a gift from God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, he sees that the prophet is available for all on the earth. And he says, and the king himself is served by the field in all, comma, and he says, a king is an advantage to a land with a cultivated field or with cultivated fields. A king is advantage, is an advantage. Are you hearing? But if you read before, he says the king himself is served by the field. That means he's also advantaged. So he tells us the king is advantaged and he is an advantage to a land with results. You see? Now, he's bringing the conversation of kingship. Now, you cannot understand this until you understand by principle that there are only two ways people become wealthy if they have made wealth the right way. They either work so hard, so hard, if, if it is right. I'm not talking about these guys who do witchcraft and sacrifice people. No, I'm talking about genuine wealth. They are either hard workers, or smart workers, or they inherit it. Are you following? Oh, they inherit it. So the Rockefeller family is living in wealth that is inherited. The kings of the world, the monarch of England, lives on wealth that is inherited. You see, up to today, England rewards the monarchy. Yes, there is that which comes in your time, but there is that which you have in heritage. Wait, let, us, let us understand this, because <laughs> I don't know that you see where I'm going. The, the, there is that which you have inherited. Now, if you read about George, go read about that boy's wealth. It will blow you. And read, read his net worth. George, Prince George's net worth. So that one, there's nothing. He, 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 unless otherwise, he, he doesn't understand when you say that you're poor. He, he would need a very good explanation to understand it. You see what I'm saying? So you are either born into it a certain way or you work hard. The, working hard is good. It's important. But not all the richest people, again, have worked hard because they've given us an equation of inheritance. Some are positional graces. She was poor and got married to a rich fellow. 
And God is trying to throw us out of the inheritance of labor. He's not saying that don't work, but he's saying labor not to be rich. He says, cease from your wisdom. You see, if you read Proverbs 23 from the Amplified Version, he says, listen, worry not yourself to be rich. And then in the, in the brackets, he says, cease from your own human wisdom. So that's human wisdom, merit. When he tells you labor not to be rich, he's saying your labor will never give you the wealth that you are supposed to have. Or even if the greatest laborer in the world is out there to inspire you, God says, I can still do more yes. than any labor in the world. If labor was equal to pay, then I know guys in, in, in downtown who carry loads from 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. I worked downtown in Chikubo. I know guys who carry loads from 4 a.m. while you're still in your bed to 6 p.m. every day of their lives. And some of them don't go back home with more than $10 the whole day. If, 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 if wealth was in the realm of labor, Jesus has given us a very, very interesting proverb. He hired one man in the morning, hired another one in the afternoon, hired one in the, in the evening and one late evening, and the Bible says he paid them the same. So there's a man with a fallen mentality, and this fellow is saying, why did you pay this guy the same as us who are working the whole day? Because he thinks that heaven rewards men according to how long they have worked. And God identifies, no, that this man is dealing with an evil eye. He says, your eye is evil. I have a someone on that to explain to you what an evil eye is. What is an evil eye? Some people have an evil eye. Why? Because they don't see that certain people deserve what they have and where they are at because they cannot see that equation. Oh, they have tried to work as hard as they can, but they don't see that wealth coming to them. Notwithstanding that people who have that wealth through manipulation, through intimidation, through, you know, outward safety. I'm not talking about that. And it happens in the church too. But we're talking about wealth from a biblical perspective. Pastor Zach, are we together? I'm, I'm, I'm going a bit deeper. I still have time. So we see that God is bringing us into a conversation of it's okay to labor. I believe in labor. I've banked for six years. I worked before like with a certain lady. I manage about three companies of hers. I believe in hard work. I do businesses too and I labor. But I don't labor for wealth. I labor for purpose. Wealth comes differently. And this is what they want to give us a conversation about from scripture. Wealth comes differently. Somebody shout hallelujah. So he tells us, if you understand how the king works for you and understand his advantage for the land and the land's advantage for him, then you have understood how to profit. Because he's telling the church, See, when the Bible says in the book of Revelations that ye are kings and priests to the most high, who is following? You are kings and priests to the most high God. God has invited you into a royal race. Somebody shout hallelujah. And he's saying that I don't want to give you by your labors, even though they are important for your course of purpose, like Paul would make a tent. But I want to reward you on an inheritance perspective. You just don't know how to relate with the law of inheritance. You know that you have an inheritance in Christ. That's why the scriptures have said we've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The Bible says we have been born to an inheritance, incorruptible. It does not fade away and it ever liveth and abides for us. Who believe? He says, we've been born to an inheritance. We have an inheritance. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. It's available for everybody who believes God. It's incorruptible, he said. 
it's undefiled. And listen, and that fadeth not away. It fadeth not away. What we are not teaching people, we are not teaching them to know how to connect to the law of inheritance. Uh, Apostle Grace, thank you so much. As you were saying that, when you touched the part of being a king, I was just reminded, as you are speaking, and Pastor Modesta, you could add to this. I remember Jesus' first encounters with the disciples at the sea. And these guys had been fishing all night. That means there's, there's labor, there's labor mm -hmm. all night. And, and, and they come to Jesus and they had nothing. They told him, Master, we have been doing this all night. And then he tells them, no, you launch into the deep. And Peter, thank God that the man that was given the grace, his name, the rock, says, Master, except by the platform, on the ground of your word, we shall cast the nets. And when they cast the nets, the Bible is very clear. The Bible says they got a great multitude of fish. So I asked the question, wasn't that the same lake? What changed? And now when you start talking about the kingly anointing, and that's Jesus speaking, the Bible says, where the word of a king is, there's power. You, as you are speaking, that, that, that started getting to my mind. And, and the scriptures are very clear. Immediately this happened. Peter called partners to help because the multitude was so big. And when they get it to the shore, the Bible says their nets almost break. That means they got too much beyond what their capacity could, could, could contain. And then Peter looks at Jesus and he kneels down and said, Master, we are sinners. That means we are fallen. There is something On that us is you are introducing. Mm -hmm. And so, Apostle Grace, when you are speaking, that came to, to, my, uh, to my mind. And, and because when you start talking about the kingly mentality, I start thinking about Jesus in our dispensation, and what he has made us be. So is, is, can you share something? Because some, someone, you see, our viewers, it's very important that you listen, because many people waste, you know, take too much time laboring, okay? And, and, and some people don't have time even to serve God, because they are so busy serving money. And this is a big issue in the church. You tell people, uh, we have service, we have, they don't have time. So please, our viewers, I want us to focus here, because something big is happening. I believe this, the church, this is important for the church right now. So Apostle Grace, based on what you are saying and, 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 and what, could you just give us a bit of I'm light? Do you want to add something before I, I share? No, I, I actually wanted to ask a question instead. What is that law of inheritance? Okay. Yeah. What is that law of inheritance? Yes. Or how do we appropriate? How do we yes. appropriate? Yes. I think that's lives. the same. It's yes. not far from yes. that. Now, let, let's, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give it from... Let me go to a biblical perspective and, and show us a very underlying principle. Interestingly, I actually have a sermon on the law of inheritance. But uh, today I want to go a bit deep and show us something. How it's one thing to know the law of inheritance. They're principles. They're principles. Okay? And when, when you study the law of inheritance, you understand why certain people have more than others. Huh? Now, let's go back to Oxfam's report. 1% of the world's population has twice, twice the wealth of the world. That's a double portion. That's a double portion. Whether they know it or they don't, the principle is existing in the world presently. Now, if you go, for example, in Deuteronomy and study what the double portion is, in, Je in Deuteronomy 21, 17, he speaks of how when you have a first son, because he is the beginning of your strength, there is what we call the right of the firstborn. And the Bible says that at the place of inheritance, the firstborn is supposed to have a double portion of all that the father has. Let, 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 let's, let's first begin from there. That means when you know how to earn the right of the firstling of God, you will always have more than 
whatever or double of whatever anybody can inherit at their best. This is the principle that makes men richer than others. And now we even go beyond the conversation of the inheritance to when you talk about an inheritance, do you receive that which is of the firstborn or the rest? Because we have ascertained that there is an inheritance that is available. But do you take that which is of the firstborn or the rest? Do you know when I understood this principle? Within about 12 months, I made my first million dollar. Because some people think that you need 20 years to make money or that you need 30 years to do this. No. God wants to take you to a place of understanding that actually whatever you think you're laboring for, Pastor Modesta, I've already created way more than you could labor. That if you go in the world of labor, you're going for purpose, not wealth. No believer at the sound of my voice should think that they can ever pay you enough to cover the wealth that God, the inheritance that God has ordained for you in Christ Jesus. Now, let me show us one or two scriptures. Let, let's have an example. In Genesis, the 12th chapter, the 6th verse, God comes to Abraham and uh, he, he, he's, he's giving him a portion. Now, I want you to see how God sees, how God grants portion. You see how God grants portion. Talking about an inheritance. He says, And Abraham passed through the land, that is, is now going through uh, Canaan, the place of Sishem and to the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. The Canaanite, now I want you to underline that the Canaanite was yet in the land. And remember, Canaan is an inheritance for this man. So, there is no way the wealth of God, the blessing of God, the inheritance of God can be appropriated without a man going prior to work for you. There are people right now working. They're working hard but they're working hard for somebody. I wish somebody said they're working for me. The Bible tells us very clearly that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. If you read it up from, from the Amplified Version, okay, he says, uh, Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaveth an inheritance moral stability and goodness to his children's children and wealth, then the wealth, listen, of the sinner, listen, finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid for. Now there is a purpose there when he says the hands of the righteous. We're talking about righteousness. Righteousness and wealth are always reconciled. You cannot understand the doctrine of righteousness and be poor. You cannot now remember, Abraham is one of the righteous ones of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. He is the right, one of the righteous. In fact, we call him the one which received in Romans 4 righteousness, the righteousness of faith. I'm coming to that. Now, he tells him, the Lord appears to Abraham and said unto him, that unto thy seed I will give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So when God tells him that I have given you this land and your seed for an inheritance, listen, the seed of Abraham does not own plots of land. It owns lands. Somebody shout hallelujah. The kingly mindset does not look to having a plot of a hundred by a hundred. The kingly man mindset inherits the world. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, but Abraham shows us how. So in Romans, when Paul sees what Abraham does in Genesis, so the experience of Abraham in Genesis, he brings the answer, the key. In Romans chapter 4, the 13th verse, let's read the ampli amplified version. He says, for the promise to Abraham or his posterity that he should what? Inherit his father's took us 
the, the mother's shoes. Huh? Huh? Answer me. He says, the promise to Abraham or his posterity that he should inherit the world did not come through observing the commands of the law, what is done, listen, but through the righteousness of faith. Let me talk about the righteousness of faith. Let's talk about the righteousness of faith. Because God has told us that that promise comes to manifestation, to inherit the world through the righteousness of faith. Let, let's explain it a bit. Let's talk about the righteousness of faith. It's very beautiful. Oh, in fact, the literal rendering, the rightness of faith. That's the literal rendering. The rightness. The degree of how right faith is in approving whatever should be available for you. Now, what kind of faith are we talking about here? You cannot awaken the conscience of man to the inheritance ordained by God when they behold a fallen image. You understand? When they behold a fallen image. You have firstly to invite man to the image and likeness of God. He says... He said, let us make man in our own image and likeness. And he said, let them have dominion, listen, over all the beasts, the creeping fields. In fact, the Amplified says, let them have complete authority, listen, to over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, the ten beasts, and listen, and over all the earth. Over all the earth. When we get to the new birth, the new man is renewed after that image. Eh? Through knowledge. Through knowledge. Eh? I have a sermon on that, so you'll enjoy that on your own time. It's coming. But the new man is renewed in knowledge after that image. In Christ. We, we must firstly help you understand when you become born again who you really are. Who you really are. Who you, not who you assume to be, not what you observe in your life and your education and your connections and your networks and your, your mind and, and, and whatever you can do and what you cannot do and how much, you know, liabilities are around you, how much debt is around you. No. We, 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 we want to understand beyond just man who is a child of God and why has he invited us to a kingly anointing the righteousness of faith concerning wealth firstly awakens the conscience to have an ideal and an attitude of who the man is see when he speaks of uh, do not be conformed to this world. Yeah? When you read the Amplified, it speaks, do not be fashioned after and, and, and adapt to its, listen, adapt to its external and superficial customs. Do you know what it means to be adaptive? Let me tell you what it means to be adaptive. Let me tell you what it means to be adaptive. What does the world tell you when you don't have enough money in your pocket? They can say, you know, learn to live within So you, you learn to adapt. But here is the error. That God you serve said, I shall supply all your needs according to the rich, my riches in glory in Christ. Not your means. My riches. She said, live according to your means. Live in your means. No. We are supposed, if the Christian cannot have enough, or does not know how to spend, we're supposed to teach them the wisdom of spending, but not the wisdom of living under their means. Because a Christian is not called to live under their means. A Christian is called to live 
on the blessing that has been given them in glory in Christ. Remove that mentality out of your head. That is why he says there is that which holdeth back more than is meat, and it is tends to poverty. And there is that which scattereth, but then it what? It tendeth to what? To, 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 to increase. So, um, is God against saving? No. The evil day is coming ahead. But what's the wisdom of saving? The wisdom of saving is two things. Two things. The first reason a Christian should save, the first one is to give. That's the first one. <laughs> it should not be second. You have lost the order. It should not be second. Giving should not be. We don't save. Primarily, we save. Let me say it this way. Primarily to be givers. To advance the kingdom of God. Because we're not giving from our sufficiency. Then two, we save to expand, increase, and occupy our craft. To make wealth for the world. The way the world sees it. So it's good to keep money and then invest it and put it here and put it there. But the primary ministry of the, of the, of the believer begins with how you give. That is why when you receive from God, he first asks, <laughs> firstly, give your tenth, give the first fruit of all your increase and of all your oblation to the priest that he may cause the blessing to set in your house. Why is the firstling of God? Now, there are Christians in the world who don't even know that they're supposed to give a first fruit. Now, we're talking about the inheritance of the firstborn. There are Christians in the world who don't even know they're supposed to give a first fruit. Ezekiel 44, I think 30. They don't know that they're supposed to give a what? The first fruit of all their increase and their oblation. You see? So, how many people even understand that? But anyway, this is how we say it. Back to what I'm trying to emphasize here. God has not called you to live in your means. Jesus never lived in his means. He did not live in his means. <laughs> he did not live in his means. If Jesus lived in his means, he would not walk with 5,000 men without food. <laughs> in human means, wisdom would tell him. Now, I know guys who would teach that. Wisdom would tell him. Why would you walk with 5,000 men and women and children without food? That's, that's what wisdom would tell him. But he knows what's on his life. He knows who is for him and what's available for him. Are you hearing me? He finds a man and he tells him, you know, they need taxes. He tells him, you know what? Go in the mouth of a fish. That's the guy you serve. That's the man living within you. Don't be mistaken. The man living within you is, is not calculating what you ate last week. The man living within you has gotten money out of the mouth of a fish. Out of the mouth of a fish. That's the one we believed. That's the one we believed. So let's go deep into the, the righteousness of faith. Awaken your consciousness. I tell people, every time I would touch into my pocket, I remember many years ago, there were times I would run out in the pocket. So every time I would touch my pocket and the consciousness arises in my spirit that I have run out of money. That very amount, I found myself giving it. And I used to say this statement, I cannot be poor. Satan, see what I've done because I'm a rich man. I usually used to give it. I usually used to give it. Because I hated the consciousness that I lack. Because that fallen consciousness is what envelops many believers with a sluggard spirit, a slacking spirit. And I think I'm going to teach that on our next Catch Me Well and, and let's continue this conversation. The slack, the slack, the slack hand. Why the Bible says that a slack hand uh, tendeth to poverty. He becometh poor, he which walketh or dealeth with a slack hand. I'll explain what a slack hand and ease and the sluggard, the spirit of a sluggard and how that works. And you'll see that many Christians are under a sluggard spirit even when they do not know that they are. It doesn't mean that they're not laboring in the world, but there's things they cannot do in the spirit. 
and and and, I, and I'll teach that. But I think hopefully the next uh, broadcast. But uh, we we still have some time. Awaken your consciousness to who you are, and that you have become a king and priest to the Most High God. Live your life like a king. Live your life from a kingly mindset. God says, if you learn that, you will be, listen, an advantage to, the, to a cultivated field. Let me explain what that means. It means everything you put your hand on is advantaged by reason of that. But the Bible says, but also the king himself is served by the field. You understand? It's served by the field. It agrees with the kingly anointing. It agrees with you. And you're an advantage to it. Did you, did you understand what I just said? It agrees with you. And you are an advantage to it. Once you understand that, Pastor Zach, nothing you put your hand on will not multiply itself as one responding to a king. The challenge with our people, like again the man of Ecclesiastes later saw, he saw that there is a trouble with the ruler. This, this is not to the blame of situations, circumstances, events and affairs. No, he says that this is a problem with the ruler. And I have seen servants on horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. But if you read above, he says the trouble is with the ruler. The trouble is the, with the person who is in charge. The trouble is with the king. The king has not understood. So he says, this error proceedeth from the ruler. It proceedeth from a king, the, 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 the king, not anybody lower. Why are you walking on feet like a servant? And why are servants walking upon your horses? That is the Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 6. Why there is power, there is glory and honor, but the man knows not. There is no power available for him to walk in it. That means anybody that is wealthy, some of us have advantaged them because we don't know how to deal with the kingly graces. If the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just, why would the wicked enjoy your wealth all his lifetime? Something is wrong with you. The error is with the ruler because this was eventually supposed to find its way into your hands. Some of you, your wealth right now is being enjoyed by another person in the world. Your portion is under another man's household and you're rotting in poverty. It's more than tithing. It's more than giving. All of that is important. But some people give with a servant mentality. They give with an enslaved mentality that they can only receive the reward of the labors of a servant, not a king. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, the kingly anointing is a consciousness that you have to awaken yourself into. You have to keep it. And how do you keep it? Through right meditation. Through right meditation. Through right meditation. Create as a king. Build as a king. I want you to realize that every king has a kingdom. That means kingship is surrounded by a realm. It's your eon. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Cobra de le bozide. Something just dropped. Mareko da baze de bo shanda breke telebro rakata la braca lando robosta. Jerica bratolo bozike teleba. Thank you, Lord. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. You said, as the scripture has said, that where the word of the king is, there is power. Now, let's talk about the king of kings. He has created and said, 
Let there be. The worlds were framed through the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made by things which do appear. Do you ask or do you create? Do you believe God for or do you create? Do you intercede and fast for or do you create? Look, look, look at Solomon's language. I built myself houses. I amassed gold. It, it, the, the, there is no provision of indifference to a place of him as though trying to exert an effort as one which can be denied that gold. Because it's a consciousness. The king is advantaged. If he goes in a land where gold is, the king is advantaged. It's his. If he goes in a place where a diamond is, the king is advantaged. It's his. If he goes in a place where there is oil, it's his. Governments and empires can have names on it, but it's his. And God can allocate a lot for you if you know how to create. Now, he has given us eons. Those are our realms. Our realms are not physical. They are spiritual. In the world that I live in, I have a consciousness. That is why I don't allow people to pay for my meals. No. It's, it's part of the royal what? Royal bounty. It's, it's royal bounty. It's, it's just consciousness. I fight with people to pay my bills. It's royal bounty. It's a consciousness. When Sheba brought gold and silver and diamond to the king and Solomon was excited in 1 Kings 10, 13, the Bible says Solomon also gave her of his royal bounty. It's a consciousness of a king. It's a consciousness of a king. That's why sometimes I would enter shops with people and I paid all their, everything they're shopping for because it's a consciousness. It's in there. It, it, it has nothing to do with what I have on my account. It's a consciousness. It's a consciousness. It's hard to be around me for a year or two and you have never tested my money. It's, it's impossible. I've either sold in you or whatever education, whatever. But everybody who has been around me, my, my, my seed is somewhere in your life. Because it's, it's a consciousness. You, you see what I'm saying? I can't wake up and look at my account and then think, oh, I need money. I don't have that consciousness. I don't buy things that way. I don't... Now, I'm not talking about Faith without wisdom. No. No, no. Some people are going to run wild and then you go in a shop and get things you're not able to pay and they will arrest you. No. It, 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 it grows. Listen, it grows. It grows on you. It is a process that by wisdom starts to grow such that your faith and wisdom are reconciled. But it can start growing on you. These days, sometimes I enter a restaurant and people pay things. I don't even know them. But they are responding to something that I, even I don't know. I told people that when I, God said to teach me these things, if you be willing and obedient, I told people, one 20, in, in 2013, the Lord said the sun will never go down without a man blessing. The sun has never gone down without a man putting money in his hands. It has never since 2013. You understand? So, they, they, they come to gift the king. <laughs> even, even when they can they just find themselves feeling it in their heart I must carry some I've never asked I don't beg I don't manipulate people for money I don't that's not me that's not me you know me even my summons I don't fundraise for a particular reason because I know who I am the challenge is that the confines of how the world wax can cause you to be confined in your understanding and instead of building a mind with God and agreeing with him, you find yourself adapting to the external pressures of the world. And he says, no, be transformed and changed by the entire renewal of your mind. By Listen, he says the mind has its new ideals and its attitudes. And he says, with that, you'll prove for yourselves what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. 
concerning your life, even that thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight. The God dream will mantle you. Somebody shout hallelujah. The God dream will mantle you. But this is what it says. Your ideals and attitudes have to change. Righteousness of faith. Righteousness of faith. Your ideals and attitudes have to change. Look at that Adam in the garden. Do you know he was never conscious about luck because those trees did not have seasons? Do you know that before the fall of man, trees did not have seasons? How many of you know that? Before the fall of man. No, you shall eat of every tree except this. That means the fruits were always dangling, hanging there. No rain coming up, no water coming from down, watering the what? The field. Pastor Modesta, Jesus is hungry and he walks to a fig tree. And the Bible says, and it had no figs because it was not yet its time to bring figs. But Jesus is hungry and he has a certain mind. So the king walks to it and he finds no leaves. What does he do? He curses it. So that every tree in the world, if it meets him, any other tree, what, what people don't see is, if any tree in the world had seen Jesus do that, what would any other tree do if he walked to it? If it doesn't respond to you, curse it and let it become a lesson to everyone else. Some of you are going to have to curse certain houses, certain shoes, certain clothes. You, some of you, 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 that's a consciousness. But why would Jesus, oh, realistically, Jesus, you are the one who created seasons. And this tree is not bearing fruit because you have ordained seasons that way. And he says, but you see, you, you, you are bearing the fallen image. That's why you look at that tree that way. And let me add to it. When you get to it, it should not only have fruit, but it should be ripe for you. Time and chance. It should be right for you. Ripe for you. Ready for you. That's the mentality. In my consciousness and meditations, I always tell myself, every door I enter is ready for me. Every door that I enter is ripe for me. Every opportunity that I go into, I have the sufficiency. Not of myself. But he has made me an able minister of this covenant. And it's in the responsibility of that realm for me to know that I have a responsibility to create that realm as I enter it. Some people enter things coincidentally. Others create what they enter. When you carry the kingly mentality, you're not going to get the best job. You're going to create the best job. When you carry a kingly mentality, you're not going to build as you have prayed for God to, God give me a house. That's a wrong prayer. That's a wrong prayer. That's a very wrong prayer. You have an inheritance? You're asking God give me? No. Because you've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus. Now, <laughs> He gets the animals that are given to wear, to wear them for help. And the Bible says, and he puts them before him to see what he would call them. And whatever he called them, they are so to this day. But if you study the right there for the name, the calling of the name, the literal translation is, he did not only call them as label, but rather he defined their nature and way of character. That's the literal translation. So Adam created the character. God created an animal and gave it to Adam to create its character. Because that's how it works. You cannot, you will never be wealthy until you learn to create. And you can never create until you understand a master meditation. You go through the word and get the substance 
Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For you said that we shall be the heads and not the tail. You connect into his dream concerning that. And then you start creating as the spirit gives you the lead. It says that by the end of the day, the sum of it is not the creation of your fallen image. The sum of it is God's dream concerning your life. That's the righteousness of faith. If you understand how to build this by faith, you will live as a king, talk as a king, think as a king, give as a king, sleep as a king, wake up as a king. And once you can do that, and I'm not saying don't compare yourself with the kings of this world. Because some of them, in fact, majority of them, carry a fallen image. I'm talking about power over men, power over kingdoms. You will start to hear God tell you, this land is yours. You, you, you'll not hear, I'm going to give you a land in the massacre. No, you'll start to hear. Let me give you one last example. One time, I was seated in my meditations and I get a vision of a certain place I'd never been to, never been to. And then I see factories were coming up on that area. Never been to that place. And uh, I ask God, what is this I'm seeing? He says, those are factories. People are going to build factories in all of that area. And then the thought comes to my head, where are they going to live? And he tells me, that's why I brought you here. That's why I brought you here. You see, that's his dream. Now, and then, I see another chunk of expanse of land in the same area. And right in that vision, I created buildings by the stories high, by the stories high. After that, I told God, thank you. About a week or two, somebody walks to me and he tells me, the Lord told me to give you a certain property. Told them, take me to it. When I reached there, firstly, I asked, how big is it? And the acreage they mentioned was the exact acreage I'd seen in the vision. When I reached that place and they told me, this is the property God has told me to give you, I asked, who owns that and that and that? See, some Arabs and Indians bought that whole stretch. <laughs> who, am, who am I talking to? Some people have bought there. Rich people, they want to put things there. I knew why God had taken me to that place. Now that's wealth. That is, that's not labor. <laughs> Houses you did not build. Vineyards you did not plant. That's what God has prepared for us. Can somebody just raise your voice and speak in other tongues? Because of time, just speak in other tongues. Keri bronda baku jara baki brazodo bo setere brande ko setere prara bada kesete jara brodo bo jakarande ke brando bo sakatara brakote. Come on, somebody create something. Wash yourself from all fallen images. Wash yourself from images that cannot speak nor have a right on your destiny. Cleanse your mind from any indifference. Release yourself of any foreign adaptations and choose to connect to what God is saying and doing in your life right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the word that you have sent in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for the word that you give us today that the king eats and feeds and leaves off the field but yet the king is an advantage to cultivated land. We thank you because we walk in the kingly grace and that the world shall profit us. The earth shall profit us. Our inheritance is available and you have given it to us by Christ. We decree and we declare in the name of Jesus that poverty is not our portion. 
We create and are going to create things that the world has never seen before. We are going to shake this world to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I believe everybody at the sound of my voice, the spirit of poverty is far from you. Strife is far from you. You shall labor on purpose, but not for wealth. Yours is available in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Why don't you just give the Lord a big hand of praise? <laughs> Pastor Modesta, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Why don't you give our father, Apostle Grace Lubega. <laughs> Apostle, we look forward to more. We want more. And um, also, if you're there and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, this is the moment. Just say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you, O oh God, that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sin. I thank you, O oh God, and you raised him from the dead. I am born again this day in Jesus' mighty name. If you've said that prayer, you are born again. Praise the Lord. Send us testimonies. Uh, we've got all the links right there. Please send us your testimonies. Tell us what God has done for you. God bless you. This broadcast was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information about the great work of God, visit us on the web at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app today and enjoy sermons, daily devotionals, and timely updates. The Fenero app, available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. You may also email us at info at fenero.org. Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Fenero, make manifest.